professor was one of those professors who lived for Kent State. Oh, okay. So when I arrived there. And uh, then a lot of other professors also left. So I was really struggling. I said, well, you know, practically except one teacher who was my daughter, Dr. Andrews. Uh, everybody was a uh, graduate student, teacher. So I told him, I said, I'm not, I'm not here to, to be learning from graduate student. I, I, I want to go to a different school. He told me he's also, at the end of semester, he's also going to Rolla, Missouri. So, so that was the time. At that time, we had a consortium of 10 universities. Our College of Engineering at Cobble University had a consortium with 10 universities, including Purdue, Notre Dame, IIT, uh, NC State, Rice, Georgia Tech, and uh, University of Cincinnati, uh, Carnegie Mellon, uh, so Stevens. So all these universities were in our consortium. So I told the list, give list my advisor, I say, which one is the best among all these I would like to go to? He said Purdue. So when I came in uh, September 63 to Washington, uh, so I used two semesters there and took mainly undergraduate courses uh, and some one graduate course. And then uh, in the summer of '64, uh, I came to Purdue. Okay. So that was uh, so I graduated. Uh, I think most probably February '66, because at that time the semester was ending in January, right. and what is not in December. So after Christmas, you went to school for one or two weeks, and then the final exam. You know. exactly. So that was the arrangement at that time. I I re know I recall. Right. <laughs> okay, so that, then I went to Purdue University and got my master's degree in civil engineering structures. In '66, uh, I went back to Afghanistan and was teaching there uh, for three years. So in '69, I came back to NC State, got my PhD. How did you happen to select? Uh, was there somebody that you knew there, or how did you happen to select? NC State. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it was just, uh, you know, there's people who were working in our school, the college. They had Some contacts that you was, had. You know. No, we had, uh, we had uh, you know, we had American professor all through this time. Mm -hmm. From '56 uh, till '73. Okay. So we had continuously American team. Okay. So right. What about family? Were you married at that time? That's an interesting story. When I finished my 10th grade, 10th grade in high school, so winter is a vacation. I went home for vacation. When I went there, my wife's uncle was sitting in our house, since from the same village we know everybody near each other. But my wife's sister is married to my father's cousin. So it's it, it just across from our house, you know, it's their house. So I was thinking if uh, her uncle is coming, he should be coming to her sister's house, not to our house, Why? He, what he's doing in our house. So we had tea and drank tea, and when he left, uh, I told my father, I said, what was Uncle Bin Mamad doing here in our house? He said, we've been thinking to engage you to his niece. I said, Daddy, how many times I have told you I am too young to be engaged? I have too many things in my life before thinking about getting married or engaged. I mean, I said, how many times I have told you? Even when I was in sixth grade, finished sixth grade, he was thinking to make me engaged. I said, no. So this time, he said, I have given my word. When my word in our culture is that I'm married. I said, thank you, I'm married. That's it. That was, uh, the, so decision was already made by my father. So I got engaged when I finished 10th grade, you know, so I was engaged. When I finished my 11th grade, I was married. And we married since then. Do you have children as well? I have three children. 
she took care, you know, all the time I was. So I was seven years in the United States for my master and PhD altogether. Did she come with you? No. Oh. She stayed home and took care of the children. Okay. okay. She brought a good three good children. Good. Successful and they're happy. So good. Each one is their own family. After you got your PhD, then you went back to Kabul? Exactly. Okay. And that, and is at that time then you were the head of you know, when I went back to uh, Kabul in uh, 66, uh, no, I mean 73, uh, you know, in the same year I think I became uh, the department head. Uh, the department was elected by election, I mean, you know, by voting. Uh, so I was department head uh, by election, elected as a department head of uh, civil and agriculture engineering. And then uh, in uh, 75, you know, become the dean of the School of Engineering. How large, of engineering. how large was the school over there? At the time, uh, we were like uh, about 600 students. But when I become dean uh, at the end, it expanded beyond a few comprehension. Normally, our intake was like 250 students each year. It's a freshman. They, they start with freshmen. There is not code or I many other what comes to freshmen. In 77, the government said, we want your graduates. Whatever it takes, we'll give it to you. But we want more of you. So I expanded the school. In 77, instead of taking 250 students, I took 1,071 students. Wow. More than quarter. And uh, you wouldn't believe it that when Henry Kissinger, you know, who was a uh, you know, State Department head, uh, Secretary of State, uh, when he came, the president of our country in his conversation, told him to help the School of Engineering. It was so important. It was so important school in the whole country because it was the only school, the medium of instruction was English. And we were, uh, we were training first notch engineer. To give you an example, our standard, to give you an example. One of our, uh, when I was dean, one of our uh, graduate came in electrical engineering to Purdue University uh, and electrical engineering. In three years, he got his master and PhD work. How large was the faculty? And now he's dean of uh, Portland University, dean of engineering Portland University. How large was the faculty that you had approximately? Well, uh, it was about totally at the time, you know, we, we expanded. It was about, uh, I think, maybe 60 professional. And uh, there were some other uh, teachers, like English and some basic science came from other sure. colleges. And we had about 30 Peace Corps volunteers. When I was dean, we had about 30 Peace Corps volunteers, which were mainly involved in English teaching, basic science teaching, and some of them in architecture, some of them in engineering, okay. yeah. but mainly in basic science. Yeah. So when I came in 77, uh, I met with the head of the, head of the Peace Corps uh, office in Washington, D.C. I think Mary King was uh, you know, the head of the Peace Corps. Her husband was, uh, I think, the president's uh, what call, uh, position. Right. So I told her I need help because I have expanded my school beyond of imagination, and I need help. I want a lot of your uh, help, to, so I can bring, I can send my new, fresh recruit on the faculty to send them to United States and get their master's degree and go back there, so they will be permanent teacher. But in the meantime, you know, they need help so, uh, to get these people, uh, you know, educated. So it was, uh, she, she was, you know, very nice, and we had about 30 Peace Corps volunteers working in the school. Good. So it was, 
It was a very good school, very good, high standard. Right. And uh, the reason it was high standard, we had very cruel <laughs> approach. We take a lot of students, and then if they don't make it, they drop out. A lot of people drop. You know, uh, we had like in 1977, we had, we had two programs. One was VTE, Vocational Technical Education Program, which was four year. And the graduate of these will go to technical high school to teach, technical high school, technical subject. And the other was engineering and architecture, which was five year program. And those people, you know, like for engineering, we had two year common, and then they will separate to uh, several electrical and mechanical. And architecture, we had one year common, and after one year, they will go to architecture. So we had four departments, you know, which was five year, and uh, one department, which was four year. So the engineering and architecture, uh, uh, you know, section, like we had 850 students admitted as a freshman. You know how at the end of second semester, I remember it. You know how many of those were left? 185. I mean, some of those that they were left also could be behind. You know, they had they they were not uh, they were not dropped, but they were on probation or they need some more courses. Though, so they have to catch up some work. So some of the other will join later, but. But those who did not have any problem passed all the exam and everything and went as a sophomore for 185 wow. after 850. So that means, you know, it was very tough standard. A lot right. of people, you know, right. could the not make it. Are the students, do they come from only from Afghanistan or from other countries? We had international students. Because that was, if people working in the MBC or other places work in Afghanistan, so they usually sent their children to engineering right. because their major structure was English, so they, were, they don't have to learn the learn local languages. Right. So we had students from Europe, we had students from uh, Middle East, we had uh, students from uh, you know, Southeast Asia, like India and Pakistan. So we had students from other uh, right. countries because the middle structure was English. So that was not a problem. So that was the only school the middle structure was totally English. What a challenge. It was it was tough, but it was enjoyable in the sense that you know we all we had we had some of the best faculty I would say in any part of the world. Yes. Because the way we selected the only criteria to select a faculty member. Let's say if you need one student, we will only select the number one in the class. The best student in the whole class we select without any other criteria. If we need two, we will take number one and number two. If we need three, we'll take one, two, three. I remember only one time we took four after one class, graduating class, one, two, three, and four. The rest of them, you know, we took mostly one, two, and three, sometimes one and two, it depends. So these students were outstanding students. Anybody who came to United States from these graduates, practically everybody succeeded to get their master or PhD and went back to Afghanistan. And a lot of Student, international student, when they come here, they want to stay here, but we had very little loss. Because these people, somehow the environment of the school was such, everybody wanted to work there. They liked it to work there. Right. You wouldn't believe it. When I finished my PhD in 73, one of my good friends asked me, well, now you have PhD, why do you to stay in this country? You can go to academia or industry, bring your family, you will have a very comfortable life. You will be surprised what my answer was. I told him I won't stay in this country if they offer me the position of the president. 
if you make me the president of USA? I said, no, thank you. He said, you must hate the United States. I said, I love it. He said, why don't you stay there? I said, somebody has to build Afghanistan too. Why not me? So I went with that intention, with that devotion, with that determination to build Afghanistan. I remember when I was in Washington U University, I had a professor, his name was Gusto Mesmer, German. Where is he? I took a course in photoelasticity with him. He gave me B in the class. But he said, anybody who is not happy in his grade, with his grade, they can appear for an oral exam. They can improve their grade if they want to. So there were four, four of us who were not happy with our grade. We had B. I, I don't know if he, if he gave anybody A. I don't remember it, but at least. So these four people were not happy with their grade, so we went to him, and we appeared for the oral exam. Among the four people, I was the only one who got A. <laughs> so this professor came to Kabul later on. And to we be were, at, at, this, at the school, at the university? Yeah, at college. Okay. We were classmates. Uh, we were roommate, okay. office mate. So he and uh, I shared the office. So we became very good friends. He was a very nice guy. So after he left Kabul, he came back to the United States. And he came to, I think, went to Indonesia to visit. You know, it's just trip, travel. And then he came to Kabul to visit me. So he stayed there in hotel, intercontinental hotel for three days. And uh, so we chat and talk and visit each other. He really came to visit me. That's what he meant for us. At the end of his trip, you know what he told me? At that time, I was dean of school. He says, Sir John, you know what has happened to you? No. I said, no. He said, Afghanistan has become your religion. <laughs> so you're so deep and involved in Afghanistan like a religion. Because everything, you know, I was working day and night to help improve the system and work the system and improve not only as a dean, I, I, I was doing everything uh, within my power within the school, but I was very influential in the whole university system because the dean's council were making all the decisions for the university uh, because there, at that time we didn't have the senate, uh, you know, faculty senate. So all the rules, regulation, and everything was with the dean's council. So we had one day a week all days, Tuesday meeting, morning till evening, uh, so to, to work on the issue of the university. So there my role was very important. Sure. Right. The role, my role was so important that, this might be a little bit like bragging, anything I wanted to be done in the higher education system, anything I wanted to be done in the higher education system was either done or in the process to be done. Good. There were cases where I was on one side and the whole dean's council on the other side. I have won the case. The reason was not, the reason was I had no personal interest. I had no personal ambition in the issue. I wanted only th I, I wanted only things to be done right. Because other people will be influenced by politics, by money, by relation, by influenced by political issue. I was clear of all. No, anything I wanted to be done is, has to be right. If somebody convinced me that their way is better than mine, I'll follow them. It is not that I was stubborn. Right. Unless you convince me 
that your way is better, then it is to be my way. So one time, the chancellor of Cobalt University told me, he became a very good friend of mine. He said, all the other deans look at my forehead. They will do what I would like them to do without telling them. I will not tell them what to do, but they know what I want, and they will do accordingly. But in your case, I'm telling you, Dr. Baha, please do this. You say, it cannot be done, sorry. I told him, well, those people want to please you, and I want to please Afghanistan. See, that's the difference. I want to do something which is good for the country and for the people, not for individual. I see you come under political pressure. You may make a decision because of politics. That's not correct, but you are influenced. I am not under political pressure. I consider me as a free man. So I will not submit myself to those pressure. I will do only thing which is right only. You know, when you, before I went to university, I mean to, to become dean, the dean's council was spending half of their time to make regulation and the other half of the time to break it. You know, they will make exception. When I went there, no exception, regardless what the circumstances is. There is no exception. Because why do you change rule? Because of influence, political pressure, because of powerful people involved. I said, no. You do not change rule for a poor guy. You do not rule change for poor guy. Nobody change rule for a poor guy who coming from a small village, outskirt of some small city or some small village, nobody's gonna, they change rule because there is an influential people involved. But I say no, rule cannot be changed. If he, if he think the rules need change, we will change it without individual be considered. But we will not change rule for anybody. And that was, so what happened in the process, when I went as a dean, there will be three page agenda for the dean's council. All these three pages are people who want special privileges, special favors, everybody, faculty, student, and staff. For after one year, or one and a half year, they realized no special favor, no special treat is in this system. You know, we didn't have anything on agenda. We didn't have any agenda. So that was the time we work on academic staff. We work, let's say, let's compare the curriculum the university. When we say physics, uh, physics one, for example, how much material is covered in pharmacy, how much is covered in agriculture, how much is covered in faculty of science, how much is in engineering, how much is in technology. You know, what, what is physics one means to the different constituents. So we, we met uh, committees, of all the teacher of different uh, colleges to come together and define what is physics one, what should be included, how much material is as a course. For three credit course, how much material is enough for three credit course or the minimum. So we work on academic stuff, we work on uh, affiliation with foreign interna uh, foreign uh, you know uh, institution. We work something academic. Those things that were wasting 90% of our time was spent. So that was the reason, you know, I think uh, I was very much instrumental to bring a lot of change in uh, Kabul University. 
noted that I was chancellor, but uh, but I was working with a group. Of the working with a group, but I was it was one of the one of the people that everybody knew. Sure. Uh, that I tell you a story. There was a Palestinian student. I think in uh, medical school. Well, the medical school was Yeah, in medical school, yeah. Okay. I mean, you know, we had a comprehensive university. All medical, professional Medical, school. pharmacy, okay. agriculture, law, uh, science, uh, and economics, uh, and agriculture, engineering, uh, theology, letters, you know, all comprehensive university, veterinary science, all this. So he was uh, in medical school, he wanted a third chance. You know, if you fail, they give you a second chance. If you fail again, then there is a third chance. But third chance is not allowed according to the rule. I mean, if you uh, flunk for the second time, I mean, you're, you're done. But this guy wanted third chance. So a lot, a lot of pressure was from political, you know, minister of foreign affairs or somebody, you know, told me the chancellor that, you know, to do special favor for this guy. So the chancellor knew when I'm there, it cannot be done. Only if I'm there, it cannot be done. That he knew. So when we came to the meeting, he said, Dr. Baha, you have lost your right to speak today. You are not going to talk. I said, okay. And uh, he, he meant it jokingly, but I took it serious. I didn't talk. So they gave third chance to this guy. So when they give third chance to this guy, tomorrow, the next week, student from Iran you know, had a big petition. So we are also your friendly country, your neighboring country, or Muslim, you know, you know, we are this kind of difficulty, we would like you know, the same the same favor be given to us. And next week hundreds of petition from the Afghan students. I said, well, if you give the favor to the foreign student, how about us? We are native of this country. <laughs> we are paying taxes. We are everything. How about <laughs> the chancellor say, what terrible thing I did you to stop you talking that day. <laughs> and now we're in big mess what to do with it. So, uh, you know, these are some of the stories that, you know, from, uh, it was interesting, you know, to, to be recorded. It was very important. Sure. Yeah. Did you have graduate uh, students there too, graduate education? No. Only undergraduate? Yeah. We, in the engineering, when I was dean, we were seriously thinking to get a master's degree in civil engineering. We had, we had about six or seven PhD faculty. We were thinking we can handle uh, graduate program. We were thinking, you know, to start graduate program, you know, in the near future. And uh, so everything was going well, but unfortunately, in the whole, uh, in the whole system, there was no graduate program. Okay. In, in Afghanistan, no graduate program. Okay. Then if the students wanted to, they'd have to go elsewhere? Yeah, they had to go abroad. And, and you're over the time that you were there, as you indicated, the enrollment really increased. But okay. and it was co-ed. Yeah, co-ed. Okay. And so the there was no problem. I mean, you know, boys and girls were in the same class. Uh, girls were Europe wearing exactly like you're wearing European, you know, clothes. Uh, they could wear short or whatever they want to do. It was totally co-ed, and there was no problem whatsoever. Okay. Okay. And did they live on campus? Were there there were some girls, uh, who, the, the girls who came from provinces. The girls who came from provinces, they were given dorm, dormitory facility. 
met de, stu- de, de girls who went from Mount Carver. They lived at home. Yeah, that was one other thing. Since I coming from province, I knew how important is the dorm. So uh, when I was at a committee of dorm, uh, you know, one time, I would not let anybody from the city be admitted to the dorm. Because if you, If you allow the city guys to go to dorm, but those poor guys in the in the province, they will never have a chance to go to school. So I was, I was very surprised. I said no, regardless what how poor the guy is, if he could survive, go to high school here, he should be able to continue with the college too. But those guys who coming from another province, they have no means. No facility that the dorm should be available. Be available to them. Yeah, I mean, see, I, you know, I was only want to be fair, sure. especially fair to those people who do not have a voice. You see what I mean? Mm-hmm. Who nobody speak for them. I mean, sure. you know, they, they, they are the, the left out. So when I was there. Sometimes student will come to me when I was dean, and he said, "Well, I'm very poor. I need special, you know, favor." I laugh with them. I tell them, "Look, from Adam in Eve time till this time, show me one person in the whole history of humanity who has done favor to poor. I will be the second." Poor do not deserve to be specially treated. Poor only think that the, the best you can do is to treat them as equal to the rest. I say, look, if I treat you special against the son of a minister of education or minister of higher education, when the next day he can fire me. He said, how come you are not giving the same privilege to you give to this guy? You know? Mm-hmm. The only thing I told, I used to tell them, the only thing I get her guarantee in my school, within my college, that you will be given the same privilege as everybody else. But I cannot give you more privilege than the well-off people. Right. See what I mean? Understand. Equal across the board. Yeah, equal across the board. So it doesn't make difference. You're poor or rich or anything. When you come to school, you're equal. And I really treated all these children, I mean all the students like my children. I mean, I was treating like the faculty was just all like my brother and sister and the, 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 the student for all my family. We right, had about yeah. 1,100 students when right. I was teaching. I'm going to turn this